All right, everybody, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, if you're wondering if you're in the right place, this is the panel on social emotional learning as is announced by this big screen here. Um, and I appreciate you coming, coming by. I know you have a lot of uh, sessions to choose from. Uh, my name's Sean Cavanaugh. I've been a reporter and an editor at Education Week for about two decades now. And um, I'm currently doing most of my writing for Ed Week Market Brief, which is uh, a publication that covers the K-12 market um, and tries to explain the needs and priorities of school officials to companies doing business in the market. And so uh, this topic is of interest to me for a variety of reasons. Um, I'll just start by saying that social emotional learning is obviously in the wind now in the K-12 community. It's everywhere. Um, we'll sometimes, you know, in my reporting at Ed Week, we'll hear of a lot of issues that just sort of emerge and take off, um, sometimes without justification. Uh, but social emotional learning um, is an issue that's come to the fore partly because districts are, are interested in trying to uh, figure out ways to help students uh, beyond the typical academic structures um, uh, of their classes. Uh, of the typical uh, approach to curriculum, testing, PD, and other things. So um, let me, um, let me just, just also say I want to keep this interactive. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the discussion with our panelists. And about midway through, I'm going to open the floor to questions. So if there are questions that come to mind, have those ready. And, um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll try to take more questions. I want to make sure that you're able to um, uh, um, get some of your questions answered and you can pose them directly to the panelists without me as the filter. Uh, so um, let me start by introducing our panel. Um, I'll start down at the far end. Rob Jagers is the Vice President of Research at the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, or CASEL. Uh, it's an organization many of you have heard of, I'm sure, um, if you've been working on SEL issues. Uh, among his various uh, CASEL duties, Rob is leading work with partnering districts partnering with districts to explore how SEL can be leveraged to promote equitable learning environments and equitable developmental outcomes, especially for students um, from underserved groups. Um, next on our dais here is uh, Andrea Lovenhill. She's the Vice President of Marketing and Client Relations for the Committee for Children. It's a, uh, a major provider of SEL programs that is currently uh, reaching over 14 million children each year in the U.S., and it's used in more than 70 countries worldwide. Uh, Andrea oversees all aspects of client success, product and implementation support, and marketing and communications uh, for the Committee for Children's programs, including their flagship SEL program, which some of you may have heard of, Second Step. Ron Goldman uh, is co-founder and CEO of Cognito. It's a simulation company. Cognito simulations harness the power of conversations um, with virtual humans to prepare people to effectively lead conversations in real life to improve health. Uh, Cognito's suite of SEL simulations for K-12 has been used by hundreds of school districts around the country uh, and has been recognized by the federal government as, as an evidence-based program. Um, Finally, our, our district representative who has extra credibility for that reason is uh, Denise Herman. She currently serves as superintendent uh, for the Roseville uh, Joint Union High School District in Roseville, California, which is northeast of Sacramento. Uh, in that role, she oversees the teaching and learning of 11,000 high school students across seven sites, each with its own wellness center. Uh, previously, she served as principal of Henry M. Gunn, high school in the Silicon Valley in Palo Alto where she integrated social emotional learning into school practices uh, to support the school community and improve student wellness. I thought what I'd do is, uh, because there's often a lot of confusion as with so many things in K-12 education about definitions, um, what I'd like to do is, is start by asking um, Rob to sort of give us a working definition of SEL because I, I think there's often a lot of confusion among both K-12 officials and uh, vendors in the community. How does CASEL typically define SEL? So first of all, thank you for um, inviting me and pulling together this panel. Um, so um, CASEL views social and emotional learning as a process like any other learning process, but it's a process 
that through which uh, young people and adults gain an understanding of emotions in themselves and in others, um, through which they develop relational skills and come to understand how to make good decisions about themselves and others across multiple contexts. Um, so what I wanted to do is start with a, a pretty broad question for the panelists. Um, you all may have your own opinions on this topic, but um, the question is, and I'll, um, Denise, I'll start with you. Uh, what's something you think schools are asking for in social emotional learning um, that the market is currently not providing? In other words, what's an unmet need where, where the market is, is, is falling short? Um, there's, there's a lot of unmet needs. Um, I think this is an area um, that has a lot of future potential. Um, some of the things that I think are hallmarks would be um, professional development for educators. Most teacher training programs still focus on content and maybe some behavior management, but they're woefully lacking in really embedding how kids learn, how kids learn content, how kids learn uh, social emotional skills, um, the whole language that goes along with that. So I definitely think professional learning continues to be at the forefront. One other thing that I know from speaking with other colleagues is many current administrators were not trained in social emotional learning also. They see its importance because they see the stress it's placing on students and staff, but they themselves would benefit from a more clear roadmap. Where does social emotional learning fit? Even in things as simple as the counseling structure. You know, how does the ask a model support wellness centers? Um, how does mindfulness fit into a well-rounded PE curriculum? You know, there are so many opportunities where administrators often don't know exactly where to start. And so I think something that lets them know where the knowledge, skills, and attitudes can fit within their school system, um, almost like a, a paint by numbers kind of thing because it's overwhelming with all the other demands. Uh, so that's, that's where I would start. You gave a great answer, as you can tell, by the uh, applause. Yeah, thank the other you. Room. Um, Good timing. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, Ron, I'll turn to you. A uh, biggest unmet need um, in terms of the thing that the market is not providing in the way of social emotional learning. So, uh, I mean, we are a solution provider. Um, so for us, um, what we think is still unmet and what we're trying to do our best to help that is that these are skills that are not being, uh, you can't teach them by listening to people talk or watch a movie. Um, we like to use the analogy that none of us learn how to ride the bike by watching somebody else, right? We had to get on the bike, we had to try, we had to fail. So I think that the, the, key, the key word that we use is practice. Mm -hmm. So what's missing are practice-based experiences for people, whether they are the educators, the staff, or the students themselves, to learn these relationship skills, these social skills. Uh, and that's where we focused a lot of our work by using virtual humans as a subject of practice where the virtual human can act as the student, for example, or the parent, which sometimes are the more interesting conversations for you to have as an educator, and for you to actually practice that conversation and learn these different skills that you need to have of everything from how to uh, discuss a concern that you have about the mental health of the child or how to just connect with the other person. Uh, so I, I would go back to you know, uh, kind of skill building needs across. Um, I think educators are important, but the students, of course, as well. Uh, and learning those through practice and using new technologies like gaming technologies and virtual humans um, and role play are kind of where we see a, a, a very significant opportunity that we're trying to help address. And just to clarify so people understand the background, so your company, it doesn't consider itself an SEL company per se, but how do you intersect with the world of SEL, well, how, how would you describe right. it? Right, I mean, we, we are a simulation company that really uh, concentrate its work on the art of conversation. The fact that a conversation is a very, very powerful tool to build connections and to drive changes in behavior. And we really, really believe in that. Uh, so for us, we do work in a lot of different areas around critical conversations in education, in healthcare, in other areas. Where SEL comes in is that when we work with subject matter experts, to help us build the content of the simulation, we really go and map it uh, back to specific topics in SEL. 
so that we can come in and provide solutions that different districts can use as part of the approach that they have. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Andrea, uh, what do you see as the biggest unmet needs? Where is the market falling short in social and emotional learning? First of all, um, I agree with Denise that the biggest unmet need is professional learning. Um, mm -hmm. But because you have covered that well, I will say uh, assessment is such mm -hmm. a gap right now. I think that there are validated good assessments and that um, they are difficult to use in some cases or maybe unreasonable according to budgets. And a lot of them don't provide you with strategies for follow-up that's, uh, and I think that's really important. So mm -hmm. a lot of folks are using assessments for screeners, but they're not using them to monitor ongoing progress to help teachers in the classroom employ strategies that are specific for students that maybe uh, need more development in certain areas. So I think the assessment question is a huge one that um, we need to begin to address. And just to follow up on that, uh, maybe you can help us define assessment, because I, I uh, came of age as a reporter at Education Week when assessment mm -hmm. Uh, we were talking about the No Child Left Behind era, high stakes assessment. How are you defining assessment in this case? Well, I, I mean, maybe I'll broaden it and say assessment and data because I think there are, um, there's multiple forms that are important. One thing that's extremely important, important is implementation fidelity. So do you have the, the data to understand how things are being used in the classroom? Um, and then I think on the other side of that, it is important to have tools to screen for students that may need extra supports. Um, in a, a sort of you know, multi-tiered system of support model. Um, and then I think you need you know, ongoing assessments of students' own social-emotional competencies, and if you're seeing growth there, not for the purpose of um, grading or, or any of that. Um, and then you also need knowledge gain assessments. So I think it's kind of across the board, and I think where we have things are the kind of knowledge gain assessments. Um, there are assessments that you can use to, uh, of course, monitor um, students' social-emotional growth, but they're not used very uh, well or across the board, and I think that you know we do have to get there if we're going to um, tailor instruction and personalize instruction for students and um, and actually help them you know have good outcomes. Right. Great, thank helpful? you. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, Rob, maybe you can describe for us what you see as sort of the biggest unmet need. I know Castle works with a lot of vendors. Here's from vendors uh, asking you to review products unmet needs in the market in SEL, as sure. far as you can judge them. So I would point to three. Um, piggybacking on my colleagues here, uh, with regard to assessment, it seems like it's the alignment between frameworks, mm -hmm. programs, and assessments. Mm -hmm. um, meaning that um, I offered earlier a definition of, uh, a working definition of social and emotional learning. Well, there are many, many frameworks available through which uh, academics, researchers, program providers begin to organize how they think about those buckets of competencies, both for young people as well as, and increasingly for adults. And so there's a need to align that kind of conceptual work with what you're actually operationalizing in the way of a program and also to have the assessments both formative and um, uh, summative uh, with the emphasis, I think, on um, formative because we, there's a concern about high stakes testing in an area where we, as from a research perspective, don't have a lot of conf confidence in exactly what it is we're assessing. And I would say much like anyone else who assesses anything. Um, the other thing I would, uh, the second thing I would point to is the um, intersection of equity and social emotional learning. That is uh, an ongoing conversation in the field and the districts we work in as we work with states as well. So we have a collaborating districts, collaborating states initiative, issues of equity, um, what equity actually means, how that then plays itself out in the context of academic, social, and emotional development, I think is an unmet need. And related to that is academic, social, and, and emotional integration. Um, so social and emotional learning, not as an add-on, a separate class, but something that is woven throughout the educational experience for both educators and students. Great, thank you. Um, Denise, I wanted to ask you, I, I know that SEL is a relatively new topic, even in K-12 education, at least in terms of practice in many districts. But you have uh, relatively uh, 
you know, you, you know, some years of experience mm -hmm. because you were trying this at your former mm -hmm. school yes. in Palo Alto. You're mm -hmm. trying it now. What have you learned over time? What, what kind of advice would you give to either district officials mm -hmm. um, in the audience or or to vendors about uh, based on your experiences? What lessons have you learned? Um, I would describe myself as one of those very modestly educated educators. Um, about social emotional learning prior to being faced with some significant crisis while I was in Palo Alto. Um, we had the suicide death of four students in one year and that prompted a significant outcry from our parent community and our public, the students themselves, to really do a whole scale audit of what, what our current practices were, what was contributing to student stress, what could we change that would alleviate student stress. Um, and so one of the things that we did, we accessed every one of your products uh, that, that next year in terms of um, building a district-wide uh, initiative to support ubiquitous kinds of social-emotional learning. But one of the things that we learned is ubiquitous can't mean just it's there and present. It has to be very intentional. And so we found ways to connect with the research. And, Castle has a wonderful way to, to view the research and see it. Um, but there's not a lot at the high school level. There's a lot more research and tools available, K-8. But we were really having students with very significant needs at the secondary level. So I do think that's another um, significant gap in the marketplace right now is secondary and even into junior college and young adult supports. Um, so I guess one of the things that I would um, acknowledge is many school districts currently are coming to social emotional learning on the heels of a crisis and that's a difficult place to be in and so as vendors and as people who are supporting schools know that know that there's probably some story that each district has that is promoting them to be investing in that part of their students education um, and that every district's journey is going to be unique and different, but kids are kids. They have the same need for a social emotional framework. And so just to tailor the work you do with potential districts or states or whatever network you might be with, with that authentic listening ear, because they don't know what they don't know, but if you listen and listen carefully, you can help match some of the things that you know are best practice in social emotional learning with what their community really needs. And, and once they find success, they will then be able to continue moving forward with some other dimensions of social emotional learning in their organization. It, let me just ask you, uh, based on what you hear from like your colleagues in other districts and based on your experience, is it the experience of most districts that the starting point for them when they say, we need an SEL strategy is usually at the point of crisis? Or is it, is it something uh, you know, sort of broader than that where they say, within our, ter our, our current academic strategies, it's not taking us where we, our students need to go? And the other panelists can weigh in too right. on this, please. I think um, philosophically or cognitively, people want to educate the whole child. But when districts actually take action is when there's been a crisis. Um, and that's unfortunate, but with budgets being so tight, I completely understand that um, sometimes to convince a school board or to convince people who might fund you with grants or whatever it might be, that the need is greater than other needs that you have. Um, it, it does take a crisis, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm very um, proud that the current district I'm in, Roseville Joint, um, we had a few crises, but we definitely were learning from the trends across the nation and invested in wellness centers at all of our high school sites um, as something we just think is best practice and where we want to put our money to support our students. We, we are trying to invest upstream for as many students as possible. Uh, Andrea, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are, we, for a long time around social emotional learning, we're in a prevention mindset, and so, and an intervention mindset, and so then it's um, a crisis would happen, and, and schools or districts would come to us. And I actually think that I've seen a shift in in the folks that are coming to us now because I think they are trying to get upstream. And we we shifted years ago to an, the idea of promotion, yeah. promoting these skills, 
strengthening kids, making sure that you give them you know, um, a toolbox to pull from when there is a crisis. And I think that a lot of schools and districts are beginning to invest in that um, you know, upstream, as you've said. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that social emotional learning sort of a blessing and a curse. It's this umbrella term and it can cover all sorts of things and it's, it's a huge lever in the lives of kids, but um, that means that districts are taking it on for such a huge variety of reasons. So it might be that a crisis occurred, it might be that um, it's academically motivated. It, and so I think that there um, is a real need for uh, attention to customizing to districts and making sure that what you offer does actually meet the need that they're trying to address um, and being transparent if it doesn't because they're kind of high stakes, the things that you're addressing with social emotional learning. And um, so I just, that kind of resonated with right. me to uh, say that there's multiple reasons people are pulling it out. Uh, Ron, you wanted to answer? Yeah, just, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, we also see a mix. Um, some district uh, or even state agencies that will come to us, not because of a crisis, but because they recognize, and I think that that's a big trend, that there is a value in SEL that has to do with the academic performance and the uh, uh, attendance of the, of the, of the uh, students, their graduation rates. Th there are more values to SEL besides just the, you know, the more soft element of it. Uh, and we do stuff, uh, we do a lot of work in higher ed where there is a pure connection between uh, supporting student mental health and uh, retention which is a tuition dollars. So we see a mix, but yes, there are incidents where we're now starting to work in Florida um, through the entire state. Uh, and that, you know, it's unfortunate, but it, it is driven from a budget perspective because of Parkland and what happened there uh, a year uh, plus ago. Um, but I think there is a shift. Um, I've been coming to this conference for a few years. First time there was so many SEL uh, discussions. So I, I think things are moving in that direction and, and so hopefully in a few years it's not just budgets are not driven by a tragedy. Um, I think the people here and the people we work with are motivated. And they sometimes don't always get the budget until something happened, which is kind of unfortunate. Right, I, I, and I know just from our reporting, um, school safety issues is, is, is one area that even when budgets are tight, uh, is they've been surprisingly tight despite state state budgets increasing at least on paper over the past few years. School safety is an area that a lot of uh, states and districts seem to be investing in, maybe not as much as a lot of K-12 administrators would like. Um, I just wanted to ask, take a uh, sort of poll of the room. How many of you are providers, uh, companies, organizations working in schools? Uh, how about uh, district officials working in K-12? Okay, we've got a, a mix. Um, I wanted to ask Rob a question about Castle because I know that you all are a go-to resource for a lot of um, both district officials and companies, but you all do actual kind of reviews of um, products and try to set guidelines for companies that are in the market offering um, SEL um, solutions. Can you, can you just describe the process you all use to, to review those materials and standards you use? Um, so I would say there are um, a few uh, people who are in that business or in that space yeah. now, essentially trying to um, understand the nature of the evidence that's available uh, around products um, and then make that evidence um, kind of like a consumer reports. Um, of sorts, and so we have done that work since maybe 2003. Um, more recently, Rand has written a fairly substantial uh, report. Uh, ESSA ha has requirements around um, evidence. Um, my, the colleagues at Harvard have also done a similar type of report. But essentially, what we're all doing is looking at the available evidence um, that um, a program or an approach has the type of impacts that one, the desirable impacts that one might expect it would have. We utilize um, uh, the available science. There are standards around um, uh, experimental design that um, can be um, deployed to try to organize the available information 
um, so that we can determine whether or not the impacts are actually um, better than chance, for example. And so randomized control trials where you have a treatment and control group are kind of the coin of the realm. Uh, larger scale studies are uh, more quote unquote valuable than our smaller scale studies. And you know, there's an evidence ladder that many, many people in the social sciences would, would recognize moving from these more rigorous randomized control trials to quasi-experimental, to pre-post-test, et cetera. And so one of the tensions uh, right now is because you have so many, so much uh, attention to SEL, you have innovation coming into the space and these larger scale studies require substantial dollars in order to execute. And so there's a tension between uh, scientific rigor and innovation and shining light on both uh, rigorous, high quality studies as well as promising approaches and programs that warrant attention but may not have the resource base to have a large scale randomized trial. That's a common tension uh, in the K-12 community. Yes. Uh, let, let me ask you, when you were reviewing products, is it a mix of tech-based solutions and other solutions that are not as heavily invested in technology? Or? Well, it, it's, there are relatively few tech-based solutions that we are, have looked at and are looking at right now yeah. as we have you know, products coming through the pipeline and a lot of it has to do with the uh, relatively, the newness of tech-based um, yeah. program as well as the robustness of the studies that they're able to do. And we also have other criteria. So for example, we have a, a framework that includes um, five competencies. Um, so self-management, self-awareness, um, relationship skills, um, responsible decision-making, um, self-awareness. And so those need to be represented in a given study in order for us to, in order for it to pass muster and move to the next phase of evaluation. For, for example, there are other criteria that are like that as well. Um, and so we, as, as the field grows, we evaluate and reevaluate our criteria in order to maximize the exposure that we give uh, people who are moving into the space in the service of young people. Yeah, go ahead, Andrea. So I, um, I think randomized control trials, of course, are the, as you said, mm. coin of the realm. But um, when you are working on digital products that you iterate, and so you break your evidence as soon as you, <laughs> as soon as you um, get it, and it takes a very long time to do those. And I think that um, there does need to be a shift there uh, because there are really promising programs that, that are um, they're going to be able to adapt as people are using them that we um, won't have funding for. <laughs> um, but um, it's also really important that you have some um, you know, sense that this program will work for the children that you're providing it to. So you have to have evidence um, to, for that confidence. And I also think this is created in the space as a provider, um, this sort of uh, murkiness around what's evidence-based versus what's research-based and what's promising versus what's established. And um, I think it's very important that uh, if you are offering a social emotional learning product of some sort, that you are transparent and that you try to educate those who are taking it on about what the research is, how far along this path you are, um, if for, nothing, for no other reason than to walk the talk <laughs> of social emotional learning, to make sure that people understand what they're getting from you, what you have some expectation that it will actually address, and for what students. Um, I, I will also mention, uh, just on a side note, you've heard these references to ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, and Standards for Evidence. As many of you know, ESSA sets different levels of, of evidence in a tiered way, uh, particularly when it comes to turning around low-performing schools, but it defers a lot of that authority to individual states. And so, um, depending on which state, um, you're in or what state you're trying to sell and you may face different standards of evidence. Um, Ron, I wanted to ask you about, so what, what do you think should be the role of technology in, in this realm of social emotional learning? Um, what, what is the potential? What can it do that uh, traditional offerings have not been able to provide so far in your view? 
Uh, I think technology gives you uh, scale, uh, gives you rapid deployment. And if you use, um, if it is around skill building, then the ability to practice uh, is critical. And then also the ability to track back data. And this goes back to, to your point. I think SEL is in a exciting, but yes, a little bit of a dangerous um, position because we are dealing with very, very important uh, skills that we're helping these kids develop. And if you don't have the data and you just get uh, blinded by the attractiveness of technology, um, it, you may do more harm than good. Right. So uh, I'm fortunate to have uh, my other co-founder be a clinical psychologist who all he does uh, is collect the data uh, to be able to show the efficacy of the programs. And we spent a nice amount of years collecting the data before we went and, and kind of took responsibility that what we do actually works. So I, I think technology has um, a lot of promise and obviously already plays a big role in how kids are connected. And with, uh, although I heard somebody say yesterday that kids today are connected to everyone but connected to no one. Um, but you know they are on that device, so it's a great place to uh, get their attention. Um, educators are on these devices as well. So you get the scale, you get the rapid deployment if you're a big uh, district or a big state. I don't know how you do this without technology. Uh, it will take you years and years to get to 100,000 or, or so educators uh, if you're a state uh, in, like California or Florida or Texas. Uh, but again, just got to be careful with the data and demand from the vendor to have evidence that it's working. Uh, not just people clicking on it, people completing it, but the skills you're trying to build, the behaviors you're trying to change, that it's been really proven that it works at a sufficient enough level before you go in and, and adopt it. These adoptions are not easy. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is actually helping clients implement. Uh, you can't just give them a link and say, you know, good luck, send it to everyone, it doesn't work like that. So a lot of um, potential, but also got to be very cautious with how you implement it. Um, I don't want to uh, overpromise and under deliver on the Q and A portion of things. So, um, are the questions you all have uh, for any of the panelists? If so, don't be shy. Just yes, go ahead. Um, anyone in particular you want to take a first? Uh... Sure. So um, some folks would fit, um, uh, would think about SEL in the context of multiple tiers of student supports. And the work, our focus is primarily on universal or tier one, that is, all young people should get access to high quality social emotional learning regardless of their, um, of their uh, circumstances. And in that way, the thinking goes, you then can better identify and focus the resources on those students who have um, the most um, challenging experiences either at home or in other, in other contexts. Um, and I think that uh, SEL, to go back to Andrea's point about its origins, really came out of uh, prevention science or earlier than that, community-based mental health work. And so it, its roots are really in serving young people from um, under-resourced uh, communities. So I think that the model itself has merit. Now, could a given universal or sets of universal programs become uh, tighter or more efficient with regard to how they address the challenges and stresses that young people have, absolutely. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hey, Frank. Yeah, uh, Andrew, you mentioned uh, assessments. Uh, I usually don't need a microphone, but I'll take it today. You mentioned uh, the lack of assessments out there, and there are some products out there that claim to be SEL assessments and do assess things, is an issue of alignment with the curriculum? Is it an issue of what they're measuring? What, what's, the, what's the problem I, with them? I, I want to be clear. I, when I say a lack of assessments, I don't mean there are no assessments. There are good 
validated assessments that, it, that exist. Um, I think you're right about alignment to curriculum. And also, many of them are starting to provide strategies, but I think they're minimally helpful. So if you, I think um, when you don't come from a, a basis of this is our approach to social emotional learning in the classroom, these are the skills that we are specifically trying, explicitly trying to teach kids and have them practice. And um, you know, if an assessment isn't really tied to that, then you can identify students that need supports, but it's hard to support the teachers and what they actually need to do for those individual students. So there are good assessments. I think they're not used very widely, although they're growing like any area of social emotional learning at this time. Um, and it's really more about how, how can they be sort of less cumbersome for the teachers to use. A lot of them are teacher observation. They have so many items. Like it, I, I just wonder if we can find that sweet spot of this assessment is really going to help teachers and kids and if they're going to have usable um, you know, strategies after that that actually make sense for those individual kids. So it's, I, there, that's where the gap is. So there's a good foundation in some of these assessments. I saw several of their hands sh uh, shoot up. Uh, yes, sir, and then I'll go to you uh, right after. Hi. <clears throat> we are in early childhood education, so my question is how much should you know, we promote uh, social emotional learning in children zero to five years old, and what impact would that have in that particular child once uh, that person enters K through 12, um, and how can we help? <laughs> Anyone? Thoughts on strategies, I guess, at the early child. And technology would be interesting to see, sorry. <laughs> How can you use it with a two-year-old, three-year-old, uh, given that uh, interaction with an adult is probably indispensable? I, I'll just say uh, the, that area is so huge. for Like what you can do for the zero to five-year-olds and that and the kind of lifelong <laughs> outcomes, you can't ignore that. Um, technology can be problematic um, because of brain development and screen time and, and I, I would um, say that the things that are designed for that age group if they are rigorously designed and researched are, are probably not using technology too extensively and where they are they are um, promoting uh, interaction with parents and, and their, their children and I you know the biggest area to focus on there is actually parents it's not the children themselves. Um, so I know that um, you probably have a lot to say on this, and you do, but I just want to say it's a major area to, to focus on, and it's probably parents that are the, the, the individuals to focus on there. Ron, you wanted yeah, to add something? I, I agree. Um, where we have done a lot of work with zero to five is not uh, work directly to the kids, but to the parents and to their, um, in California, for example, there's, um, I believe it's called under five, um, program where there's a lot of um, experts who work with parents of kids zero to five and giving them a lot of skills on how to best engage their their kid, how to best interact with them. A lot of it has to do with reducing uh, ACE um, and giving them those type of skills. There's a lot of opportunity there where the reason they're coming to us is because um, if you traditionally would learn through role play on how to have these conversations, um, finding a, a three-year-old that can act um, in a specific way so you can practice that in, in person is a little bit difficult, but you can create them as a virtual character and give you that type of practice. So um, there is, you know, we started in higher ed, we then moved to K to 12, we're now doing things at the zero to five, and it, it keeps going there. So I think there's always room, but it's, in our case, less to the kids, more to the parents and those who work with parents. Uh Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say to follow up, I think where, where you can do direct work with kids at that age that um, we have seen a lot of really good results from in our research is um, executive function. So, and we in our program employ games and they have amazing results for those kids and getting them ready for school. And so I, I think there are things that are appropriate to do with the kids, especially the three to four year old age range. I saw, uh, yes, you want to go ahead with the question? Hi, my question is for um, Ms. Herman. Um, my name's Jennifer and I teach kindergarten um, here in San Diego, actually in El Cajon. And you had spoke earlier about the, the need for um, professional, de professional development for educators. 
And so as an educator, I applaud you for saying that because we, that is something that's seriously lacking for us and especially for the young ones, for, for kinder, for first grade, which we know is a very impact, those are very impactful years. Um, so when you were working in Palo Alto, what kind of um, systems did you put in place to help support teachers and how they interacted with students to help grow? So, I mean, it's just like their daily actions with the students or what, what kind of support did you provide those teachers? In Palo Alto, we formed a K-12 social emotional learning task force that was going to go beyond the crisis response, but was going to incorporate social emotional learning at every grade level for every adult, not just classroom teachers, but our, you know, our custodians, our secretaries, everyone who has a role to play in interacting with the students. Some of the things that we did um, on that committee was to identify the framework first around which we would build all of the infrastructure. One of The one that we ended up selecting was from University of Washington, um, and that state has invested a lot of research and energy to develop a framework, but they also have, uh, for their, they have six standards, and um, one of the things that they had that our teachers really appreciated were some developmental rubrics that might talk about a certain aspect of self-awareness and what that might look like. But it talked about what would that look like K-1-2, what would that look like 3 four, five, what would that look like middle school, early high, and, and then uh, second part of high school. It gave teachers a common language to talk about. Um, we also um, were involving teachers very highly in the selection process for um, a social emotional learning curriculum, which the K-5 teachers were very much wanting to integrate within um, their practice. We had a little more work to do in our middle and secondary schools for teachers to feel as comfortable implementing social emotional learning lessons uh, in the classroom. Um, so one of the things that we did is um, we, we didn't say, okay, high school teachers are off the hook. We made sure that we partnered our high school teachers with some of our elementary teachers in, in terms of sort of study buddy kind of things and talking about different lessons. Um, I, I think that depending upon the size of your district or other things, um, I'd say it, involving as many teachers as possible in the framework selection, in the identification of professional learning frameworks, we both at Palo Alto and in Roseville, um, my staff has used Cognito. And one of the things that we appreciate about that is, um, especially when you're coming out of a crisis situation, many teachers um, themselves are very much suffering uh, from the trauma of uh, a social learning event or a death of a student. So the fact that they have a way to personalize their professional growth in that area um, to not have to sit in a room of 200 people and hear a lecture on what to look for for signs of depression. The fact that they had to, got to wear headsets and be in their classroom and then we came and we have had different kinds of uh, reflection circles and things like that. So I think it's using SEL practices to design <laughs> SEL that you want in your school system. Um, any questions, any other questions from the crowd? I've seen a lot of hands go up. Um, anything else? Let, um, let me uh, turn to sort of a basic question, which I, I, I ask this partly because this has come up in, in my reporting. I may have even asked a few of you on the panel uh, you know, in an interview at some point. Um, when we talk about SEL and what it looks like in a school, uh, I, I know a couple of you have talked about it shouldn't be sort of something where a provider swoops in and offers SEL in one context, but it should be integrated or woven throughout. Uh, I guess, let me start with Denise. What is it, so what does it look like? Are we talking about, it's not a, is it a part of a standalone class or is it something that's integrated across subjects? What, what, what should it SEL look like? Yes, to all of those. Okay. Um, one of the things that we learned from the research is that it, it has to be multidimensional. Um, when we think about a healthy school environment, you have to be investing in the social emotional lives of your staff of your parents and of the students, and we found ways to provide education for all three groups. It also has to be at the, 
you know, um, proactive prevention. Um, so at our wellness centers, a, a certain percentage of their time is based on reducing the stigma around receiving access to mental health services, um, let alone providing the services themselves. So we looked at it as upstream, um, you know, uh, providing services to students who are identified and then doing having crisis counseling. So I would say that thinking about your system and making sure that it, the delivery models are in advisory kinds of programs where it's not connected to any classroom grade, where it might be in a PE or a health curriculum where that is connected to the content but the kids understand that connection and parents understand that connection to something as um, more uh, optional in terms of clubs and other kinds of ways that students can be advocate for mental well-being on their campus. Um, so when I, when I think about it, it has to be intentional ways that you integrate it into your school community um, for every stakeholder group, for every grade level, um, and every kind of learner. Uh, Rob, you've spoken about how SEL should not simply be another add-on. Yes. Right? So what do you mean by that, seen through Castle's lens? How should, if it's not an add-on, how, how should it be woven throughout? Well, I, I think Denise offered a great um, uh, picture of what um, integrated academic, social, and emotional learning ought to look like. Um, she also used the notion of whole child. And so when you, you know, it's hard to imagine that um, one might think that if as a teacher you face a classroom and all you're facing is a brain. I mean, it's, you know, they're human beings who um, have started a day, their day in a particular way, who have relationships with people in the classroom, who have some sort of relationship with you as an educator, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, and all of those things matter, and they matter all the time. And so, um, you know, we talked earlier about frameworks, and so if you, the, the Castle framework, for example, has young people at the center, but then builds out. These are all uh, from the young person to the classroom, to the school, to the family, to the community, and certainly to the nation and to the globe. It's, uh, you know, it's an ecological model, and all of those are developmental contexts in which learning, and through which learning occurs, and those those contexts are related to one another, so one might think about family, school, community partnership as a way of bringing some harmony to the ways in which the adults interact with the young people. Because you know, learning is really, I mean, another way of thinking about it is socialization, right? And all of these places are where young people are being socialized, and the degree to which the adults agree on what the socialization pathway is, the degree to which Young people are reinforced for desirable behaviors and helped with when they're challenged around realizing those desirable behaviors. I, yes, go I ahead. I uh, feel the need in these conversations to call out that there is still a place for explicit instruction and practice because you you know use the bicycle analogy earlier. You don't just want to show a kid a, a video of a bike of somebody riding a bicycle and think they can do it. Um, you want to teach them the parts of the bicycle. You want to teach them how to ride the bicycle. You also want to teach them the rules of the road, right? And it's hard to, I think that um, you run the risk when you talk about integration of thinking it's something that exists in the ether, that if we're all just nice, or if, you, you know, if you're doing these sort of climate initiatives, that that's enough. So I, I like the approach of thinking about it from the adult, the child, the specific grade level. It does have to be very specific and intentional. And you, you do have to show kids and teach kids and then model and, and have those reinforcing points and you have to make time for it. Um, so I just always want to call that out. Some yeah. folks that come to us who are sort of new in the world of social emotional learning feel that that's a confusion point for them. Um, we're at the end of our allotted time. Thank you all for coming today. If you'll join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, for their discussion.